Okie doke. Well, welcome everybody to Solar Noon Tuesday this week. Um, let me let me go ahead and hit the uh, solar news for the week, and then we'll go ahead, and then I'll ask if anybody has any questions, any issues for the week before we get into the wonderful world of perovskite, which uh, there's some interesting developments there happening. All right, so this week, uh, FERC, and I couldn't remember what the FERC acronym stood for. It's like, uh, what is it, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission? I think that's pretty much what it is. Anyway, they've come up with some new um, transmission rules, and these are being propagated out there to the world. The transmission is the high speed, um, uh, high um, voltage lines that take the, from one region to the other. And it seemed like all these rules that they're propagating right now should have been in place long ago. Uh, when I looked through all the changes, they're saying regional authorities must now do long-term planning based on available technologies. Duh. Um, they can now incorporate long-term benefits over and above uh, simple economic uh, short-term items when they're developing how they're going to integrate uh, systems. So there, I think they're saying, okay, it may be cheaper for you to put a gas power plant right here, but the benefits may, or the, the problems may outweigh the benefits. So look at, look at it holistically. Um, they're going to, uh, they're supposed to be more transparent in how they propagate these, um, these decisions and figure out an equitable, equitable cost allocation. So where, where they're getting to right there is a lot of these decisions are made in secret, which is of course the way government loves to operate. But also um, when they run up against a uh, limit, a hard limit on how much power they can put into these transmission lines, often they'll say that if you're a, a new, new power plant or a new solar array or a new wind farm, if you wanna be put onto the system, you've gotta pay all the costs of upgrading that system to accommodate the new power. And people would argue saying, well, that's not equitable because essentially those people who are already there uh, pumping power onto the grid don't get any new costs, but it would be sort of like saying, okay, if I decide I'm gonna drive on the road, the road has already reached its capacity. So they're gonna to have to add a lane. And I personally have to pay for that lane because it wouldn't be needed unless I wanted to drive on the, on the road. Um, so, so the new guys are saying, hey, let's share the cost of the expansion. And the old guys are saying, well, we don't need to expand except for you, you know, cause you wanna join the party. So they've got to come up with a solution. And it looks like FERC has just said, well, we don't have a solution. So we're going to kick it down to you guys to figure out how to do that. So good luck with that, I suspect. Um, the DOE, the Department of Energy, has announced they've got a new digital platform um, where they're trying to connect low-income households with community solar projects. So there are currently about 21 states in the Washington, D.C. area that have community solar programs that have incentives for low and moderate income households to be connected to the community solar. And just as a refresher, community solar is, is a situation where there's a large solar development. And uh, instead of you having solar put on your home, you can buy into a portion of that development and have that allocated to your, to your electric bill. Well, they've got programs where they want low and moderate income people to do that, to, to work with that, reduce their, their electric bills. So DOE is saying, okay, we're gonna work through the Department of Health and Human Services. So if someone's on welfare or somebody's receiving assistance, we're gonna direct them directly to the solar development people and say, here's somebody who qualifies for these subsidies. You guys get together and make, make the arrangements. So. Sounds like a good idea. They're hoping to connect at least 5 million households by 2025, and uh, that will save about $1 billion in, in household electric costs because they'll be going through community solar. A couple of plant announcements I, I thought were interesting because they're sort of showing how the growth of solar is impacting jobs more than, than just people installing systems. 
Next Tracker has announced they're building a construction, uh, the, a product plant in Texas, adding about 50 new jobs. SMA America, which is the uh, inverter manufacturer, is setting up a new headquarters in California. It's going to employ about 200 people. So a lot of product manufacturing starting to return back to the U.S. California set a record on April 3rd of this year. 98% of all of the power used in the state on that day was renewable, wind and solar primarily. Uh, their previous record was on March 27th, so about 10 days earlier or so, um, or a week earlier with 97%. So they're getting right up there, at least in the springtime. Um, they've our, their overall goal is to have 100% by 2045. So on at least individual days, they're already to get, getting close to that. Although if you guys have solar arrays, you know that this is the time of year they like perform best, you know, where there's a lot of sunshine and it's relatively cool. So the real test will be in August when it's really hot and there's a lot of demand whether they would be able to hit it. And of course, for California, it's gonna be storage that's gonna be the big issue as to whether they can, they can meet the 100% goal. Speaking of 100% goals, Amazon uh, is set to reach their 100% goal by 2025, which is two or five years ahead of schedule for their uh, renewable goals. They currently have 310 um, solar and wind projects worldwide, and they've got 37 new projects they've just announced, 23 of which are in the U.S. So uh, they're, they're looking right on target. And then which sort of prompted me in the idea of Perovskite, uh, Tandem PV, which is a company out of California, just got a bunch of cash they were founded in 2016 from a program by the Department of Energy called the Cycleron um, Road. Who knows, it's an accelerator program from the Department of Energy. And their goal, this, this program's goal, is to have 50% of all the solar cells that are manufactured in the world uh, be tandem perovskite and silicon by the year 2050. Um, the, the encouragement there, I don't want to pre, pre get to what I'm going to talk about here in a little bit, but basically with tandem solar, which is essentially adding perovskite on top of silicon, they found they can increase the efficiency by about 50% and reduce the costs of manufacturing by about 30%. So, uh, that's, that's the promise that's held out by perovskite. So other than a whole bunch of projects that were being announced, you know, which are sort of now a dime a dozen when they say one gigawatt project here or 500 megawatts there, um, you know, uh, that's the news from solar. So did anybody have anything they wanted to bring up for the good of the cause here this week? Give you guys just a second. No? Um there was an article in today's Wall Street Journal that looked like it's uh, what Steve Spoonamore was talking about of the, the mirrors going up onto the sodium tower. Um, oh, yeah. And yeah. then and I don't know if that's something that anybody else thinks is going to work, but what's your spin on it? Yeah, I, what they're talking about there is a whole different industry. It's basically um, concentrated solar. And, and that's at a uh, utility scale typically. And they take mirrors um, from either a big tower or rows of mirrors in a parabolic or whatever, and they focus it on a liquid. Typically it's gonna be liquid salts um, because water just would sizzle up in those kind of temperatures. And they create and they store that heat. It's a lot like solar thermal. Um, and then they use the heat from that to uh, run a steam turbine. Uh, so it's, it's a concentrated solar technique, very efficient. And there are a lot of them out in the desert Southwest uh, when you have high concentrations of sun, because as we've mentioned before, solar thermal can be as much as 70% efficient in taking the heat energy from the sun and turning it into electricity. So um, 
So yeah, it works, it works, but not for a house. You know, it's gonna work for a utility. Um, you know, that's, that's all fine. It's sort of like putting a coal power plant at your own home, you know, it's, it ain't gonna happen. And often they have external combustion engines or what do they call those, Stirling engines or something like that, that, that absorb the energy. They're not internal combustion engines, but they're external combustion engines or external heat engines. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And, you know, just shows there's a lot of energy out there. Anybody else have something for the good of the cause? Jay, I if think. You... Oh, go ahead. Okay. I'll get Don. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Don, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, I, uh, I don't know if you've seen, I saw where GAF came out with a new set of uh, roof uh, panels, which yeah. I don't know if you've seen the new ones that look like actual shingles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I saw some of those. There seemed to be a number of companies trying to come out with solar shingles. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I'm just not sold on them, you know, myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but if that's your niche, you know, obviously it's, it's somebody's buying them, but it's not big. The marketplace yeah. is not huge. Yeah. I, I still think there's a lot of um, uh, wire manufacturing, wire uh, management management issues yeah and in fact the one system i saw actually raises up it's like they're they're laid on top of like slats and all mm -hmm. the wire management goes underneath which seems to add a lot of cost to the installation this was a different one this was one i because gaf had a, a set of shingles out a couple of years a year or two ago that didn't go anywhere um this one was just completely laying flat and then they hit the wire management on a channel that goes on the side on top. And uh -huh. then they put a little cover over top of it and it runs up to the top or the bottom, I guess, and then goes into the attic. But um, it, it looked like their power density was less than your standard uh, current uh, normal panels. But um, actually it, it looked a lot better than like the Tesla ones. It wasn't anything like that. It was, it was an actual flat shingle. It looked kind of interesting, I thought. Right. Yeah, I could see um, that, you know, there's going to be some inherent issues there because, of course, there's no passive air cooling. That's right. So so there's going to be that. They're going to yep, be thin film. That. Yeah, they're going to be thin film. So, you know, yeah. but if the price is right, you know, if, if, if the cost is <clears throat> cheaper than mm -hmm. putting shingles and then solar, you know, if you're doing right. a new roof and and that's going to be kind of their their it's all going to be down to economics. You know, it's like, if it's cheaper. Yeah. So I think that was the real key. It was, if you did it that way, you didn't think about your normal roof. You have to put on the roof, then you put on the panels. And we've talked about how, if you have to redo your roof, the panels have to come off and they come back on. You have to hire somebody to do all that. It's a separate team. This was a set of uh, roofers who just did this slightly different than their normal roofing, obviously, but pretty close to that same line of work. Yeah. Yeah. And then the wire management was relatively straightforward, at least okay. until you got into the house and the inverters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Devin, and I'll get, and then Bob. Yeah. Um, just to recap what you were saying about the uh, cost being transferable to uh, customers for the upgrading. Um, this also happens in the Caribbean where um, commercial solar projects, if they are proposed by private entities, they have to bore the cost. Uh, the upgrade at the electrical facility from the utility uh -huh. that is part of the agreement so it's not that something that happens in the states it happens in the caribbean islands as right. well right uh, but before i go i just wanted to um two things i saw a news article the other day about um manufacturer came up with a pv module instead of using the um the aluminum anodized frame they were actually using um steel or something of a stainless steel format for the framing of the um, pv modules Right. And uh, so I did see that. And the final thing, I just wanted to ask clarification. When it comes to string inverters, DC to AC ratio, and a particular manufacturer say for 50 kilowatt output in a string inverter, you could go to 75 kilowatt on the DC side. What are the advantages if you go to say 60 kilowatt? Is, is there any kind of pros and cons about that? Yeah. So so what what is asking about is essentially the the concept of clipping um, when you talk about the dc to ac ratio in in putting in an array versus um an inverter and the same thing happens on microinverters versus string inverters and 
as you're saying, they, they will oftentimes tell you, uh, it kind of depends on who you're talking to, the solar module people or, or the inverter people, because the inverter people want to sell you the inverter and the module people want to sell you the module. And they're saying, okay, the inverter guys will say, you know what, with a, let's say a 10 kW system, all you need is about a 7 kW inverter because you'll get a certain level of efficiency um, by having the, um, the, the bigger array with the smaller inverter. And, and the concept there is that first off, all of your panel specs are made, are, are set at standard test conditions. So you're talking about 70 or 25 degrees Celsius and um, 1000 watts of insulation or uh, yeah. Of irradiance, so those days happen rarely. Um, it's either going to be warmer than that, colder than yeah. that, not as sunny as that. So, if you had a 10 kW array, there may be only let's be generous and say 25 days a year when you would generate 10,000 watts at any one moment. So the smaller inverter is going to be fine for those days when you're not generating that much. But the, the curve, the production curve on a sunny day is gonna be sort of a simple bell curve. And if you put a smaller inverter in there, and I don't have my whiteboard set up here, or I, I'll, I'll do it with my hands. So you got a, a bell curve going, but your array is gonna clip off the top of that production. Okay, with, with, the, with the big panel, let's say you've got a 7 kW inverter, 10,000 watts, and it happens to be just generating 10,000 watts. Those top 3,000 watts are going to be clipped off. That's lost okay. energy, which conceptually makes sense. Um, but then if you show that with the bigger array, the production curve gets bigger and starts earlier, um, and and with the smaller, if you match them exactly, the curve's going to be smaller and shrunk down. So the shoulders of this production curve actually generate more power than the amount that's clipped off. So, so because you're getting more power earlier and more power later in that bell curve on the shoulders, that compensates for, for that clipped off area. But the real issue is, which costs more, solar panels or inverters? That's really what you're getting to. Because if you could put a 10,000 watt inverter for the same price as a 7,000 watt inverter, well, then it makes no sense to clip at all because you may as well get the full production. But if the difference in cost is substantial, then then you begin to get to clipping. And the clipping ratio that they typically recommend is 1.2 to 1.3. So, okay. so if you've got a 10,000 watt inverter, you can go to like 1300 watts on the high side or 13,000 yeah. watts on the high side of your array. So that's, that's today the, the, it's typically gonna be 1.2 to 1.3. That's the standard in the industry. Okay, thanks so much. I think I have another okay. user on the show. Yeah, and I know what you were talking about with infrastructure. A lot of times, if you're especially a commercial now, and you're wanting to put a solar array on your property, and let's say that you, you're fed from a common transformer that's up there on the pole somewhere, and you're in an industrial park or something, and that transformer has like a 60 amp capacity, and when you go to add power to it, it may, there may be other people in your industrial park that already have solar. And if your addition goes beyond the 60 amps that might be returned back to the utility, then they're going to say, well, you know, we got to upgrade the transformer and you've got to pay for it. So, yeah. so that's often going to be the case where you all of a sudden get hit with this $15,000 bill, you know, of, <laughs> I don't want to pay for your transformer. You're going to own it. You know, it's like, why aren't you keeping your infrastructure up to date, guys? And so that's when you negotiate and you argue. Because logically, if they're servicing the entire, you know, the power coming from them to the industrial complex, the transformer should be adequate for that. And if nobody yeah. is generating power more than they're using, 
the power should be adequate going back to, you know, because yeah. if it's bi-directional, it should only be a problem if somebody's overproduced. So that's my logic anyway, but you know, you're talking to one utility that has a monopoly and if they say, hey, pay us 15 grand or you can't connect. But I just guess if you're there, you're the utility company. You know. Yeah, and <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, they don't care. <laughs> it's like the old Lily Tomlin routines with AT&T, you know, we don't care because we don't have to. So yeah, Bob, you had a question? No, I just wanted to say that in my reviews for last week, there's been a lot of uh, activity on solar, on sulfur batteries. Okay. <clears throat> there's a statement that <coughs> um, Tesla cars will go from 300 miles to 900 miles. Um, and there's a big push on that, or a lot of hype from the manufacturers trying to get their products going. Mm -hmm. But sulfur battery seems to be active on the news right now. Any thoughts? I, I don't know enough about sulfur batteries, but I do know that, like I like to say about solar, we're in the floppy disk age of solar, and we're not even close to the floppy disk age of, of batteries yet. You know, we're in we're in the hieroglyphics age of batteries. It's, it's going to change so much that, you know, it's going to be astounding. You know, we're, we're just touching the surface. I was so, going to say punch cards, but hieroglyphics is better. Yeah. Punch cards. I, that's when I was studying computers, you had to punch them in and carry the big thing and slurp them down in. And, you know, that so was. So you're saying I, I have a, a, a use for my floppy disks that I have in the drawer here and been keeping it. For like <laughs> I know, I know. I've still got some floppy disk external drives that I could hook in um, if I had a serial port on my uh, computer, which I no longer do. But uh, <laughs> okay, anybody else have any any questions here before we jump into perovskite? Yeah, Mike. Yeah, um, while you guys were talking about uh, updating the equipment for the electric company, I was wondering if anyone have experience with the American Electric Power, um, AEP in Ohio, whether they require individual property owners to update their transformer, these type of things. It, it would be very rare um, especially at the residential level, um, that that would be an issue. Uh, AEP has a reputation of being pretty good around solar um, compared to, say, a company like First Energy up in northern Ohio, which is pretty crappy. Um, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> I can see your uh, Jay is, is nodding his head. Yeah, I live in First Energy. I always like to say utility companies aren't evil. They don't get up every day trying to destroy the world, with the exception of First Energy, which, uh, yeah, they're like the Darth Vader <laughs> of, of electric utility companies. So they are evil. But uh, I don't know. Um, has anybody had an experience where they've had to upgrade any of the uh, transmission, any of the systems? Uh, looks like not. So uh, are you looking at commercial or, or residential? Here is the problem. It used to be a, one second. Here is the thing. This is the property. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's a pretty, yeah, that's a commercial property there, right? Uh, used to be they built for commercial for three generation. Then it is turning back into residential. Oh, okay. So zoning is residential too. So okay, but it's multifamily then residential. No single family. Really, that thing looked huge. So yeah, it is one point two four acre, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it is huge. Yeah. It's in the middle of the town. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, I just noticed from all the parking spaces there, so. Yeah, 40 parking space. So here's the thing. It used to be used for commercial. So oh. that's why the last week I asked her, how do I tell it's a three-step or one-step? Uh, 
So with that said, uh, that's what I'm dealing with. I don't know if they will ask me, since it's now residential, single family residential, they are going to ask me to do whatever to change over or... A lot of times, uh, and I don't remember if AEP has that, they, they look at it if the size of the array is bigger than 10,000 watts, okay. they may impose commercial uh, fees on it and treat it like it's a commercial install, um, whether it is or it's not. Um, so, okay. so you might want to check with them to see, because often in the application process, they have one application for less than 10,000 watts and another application for greater than 10,000 watts. Although because systems are getting bigger and bigger, that number seems to be going up as well. So they might have changed the threshold to 15K uh, W or, or something like that. So check with them to see what they consider commercial um, and okay. if they have a different application process and permitting process that's required for that. So that'd be kind of the first step. Usually the first step in your installation is to talk to the utility. Hopefully you can find somebody there who knows what they're talking about and see what their regulations are, what their, what their hot buttons are at the moment, because they change over time as well. So. Okay. May I ask another very stupid question? No, well, it won't be stupid, but go ahead, Mike. <laughs> All right. When I look at the electric bill, and trying to figure out what I need for the facility that I'm going to move into. If I figure the 30 kilowatt, is that a, normally that's per day or that would be per month? Well, it's your, your electric bill is gonna tell you, you know, like, like the per month charge typically, uh, mm -hmm. 30, Kilowatt hours is a fairly average daily usage for a suburban okay. home, uh, which would translate to about 900, somewhere between 900 and 1,000 kilowatt hours per month. Um, mm -hmm. So on the bill, often there's a graph that will tell you the last 12 months worth of, of uh, usage. And you want to just figure out, since it's grid connected, what is the average month? Because with houses that have uh, electric uh, air conditioning and the like, the summer yes. months may be really high, the winter months may be low because they have a gas furnace or whatever. So mm -hmm. you're gonna be dealing with the average because yeah. you're gonna, you know, on average, you build up a credit and then you use the credit. So AEP is typically gonna annualize the, the thing and sort of once a year, zero it back out. So, so if you go with the average, you should be fine. Um, okay. Then and, and 30 kilowatt said, hours is a good average for Good something. average. Okay. So when I look at the system when the, on the application, they say this is, a, let's say, commercial more than 10,000 kilowatt. Is that a per year or that's a per month they are looking at? No, that's uh, when they're talking about the system, they're talking about instantaneous power as opposed okay. to energy generation. So that would be saying that in one hour of standard test condition sunlight, like mm -hmm. 1000 watts per square meter and 25 degrees Celsius, it will generate 10,000 kilowatt hours in one hour. So it'd be like saying oh, yeah. it's a four horsepower engine. Well. You could say, well, how much gasoline does that use? Or how much energy will that produce? Well, you don't know. You got to know how many hours you're running it. Oh, so, okay. Now that makes sense. That's just the size of the system. And okay. If, All if, you, right. if you throw a blanket over it, it's not going to produce anything. You yes. Know? It, but mm -hmm. it's still going to be a 10,000 kW system. Um, oh, okay. You know, it's just not producing because there's no sun. So. Okay, and, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Okay, any other questions before we jump into perovskite? No? Okay, so um, yeah, I was doing a little research. So let me, I wanted to get touch base on solar panel efficiency. And any of you guys who had 
had me in class, I always like to poo poo efficiency as a non issue because the real issue is how much does it cost per watt of generation? I don't care how efficient the panel is. Um, if it's cheap and it lasts, you know, that's fine. Where it does become an issue is if you have limited space. So if you've got a small roof space and you need to generate X amount of power, then efficiency might be an issue. But people like to look at efficiency and see what is, what are, you know, is a 30% efficient panel better than a 25% efficient panel? You know, not, not intrinsically. It, you know, because let's, let's use if a 15% efficient panel versus a 30% efficient panel, if, if that 30% panel costs more than twice as much as the 15, you may as well buy two panels and stick them up there. You know, that's where you're getting the price per watt, unless you have limited space. So anyway, hopefully that didn't confuse it. But in 1961, two, two scientists, one named William Shockley and the other named Hans Joachim Quasar, determined that the inherent limitations of silicon say, state that silicon panels, the way they're manufactured, will never produce more than 33.7% efficient panels. So that's known as the Shockley-Quasar limit. And it's been reproven over through the years. And basically the limitations come from two major factors. One is what they call um, black box radiation, which essentially means that everything that's not at absolute zero generates heat. And so some of that sunlight is going to be radiated off as heat. And they estimate about 7% of that energy is going to be lost due to the black box radiation effect. But the real factor is silicon absorbs energy at a bandwidth of about 1.1 electron volts, which happens to correspond with the visible bandwidth of sunlight. And if you remember back in school, the electromagnetic spectrum, where you went from gamma rays and, and radio waves and, and infrared, then you had this little sliver of, elect of visible light, and then you went with ultraviolets and, and all these other um, waveforms that are, are smaller. Um, then if you're only absorbing in that very limited bandwidth, they're basically saying that in the radio, microwave, and infrared range, about 19% of the sunlight's energy is contained within that. So their radio, their waveforms that are too, um, too weak or too small to um, be absorbed by silicon. And then on the other hand, ultraviolet and all of those are 33% of the energy. So 19%, 33%, 7%. And then there's some that are due to impedance and things like that. You end up that only about two thirds of the energy or one third of the energy in the sunlight can be absorbed at the maximum. So those are the, con the concepts that are telling us where the limitation is on solar. So a lot of times in today's market, we have solar panels that are about 22% efficient, 20, 22%. Well, people will say that's not very good but it's actually pretty good considering the best we could ever have is 33%, you know, so not, not horrible. Um, so that's where we're at. Well, if you're thinking about designing solar panels, how would you increase that, that efficiency? So one of the ways you can do so is through concentrated solar. You basically create a mirrored system and, and focus more sunlight on a smaller space, like a magnifying lens, except that becomes relatively expensive. So what you're doing is instead of a thousand watts of energy per square meter, you're gonna increase that by some factor. So that's one approach, but it's an expensive approach. Another approach is how do we expand the absorbing capacity outside of that narrow band of visible light. And that's where um, perovskite is coming in. 
um, at the moment. And, and perovskite actually absorbs a little bit better into the infrared band. So it will absorb some of that as opposed to silicon. So now the current usage of it is they're taking a layer of perovskite, putting it on top of a layer of silicon and they're absorbing a little bit more of the, the light band. And so now they've been getting efficiencies up close to 30% on these, and they refer to them as tandem solar panels. Tandem in that there's perovskite and there is um, silica. And perovskite is, is oh, not a, a mineral oh, per se, okay. but it's a, um, it's a, it's a class of minerals. Um, so, so it's not like silicon, carbon, whatever. It's not on the periodic table. It's a class of, of different types of, of minerals and they're readily apparent. So, um, so to give you a little bit of history about perovskite, uh, it was basically first tested at Brown University in 2009 they were able to get 5% efficient panels out of this. By 2012, they had increased the efficiency to about 10%. By 2021, last year, they were up to about 25%. So already it's more efficient than just straight silicon. Um, and they're anticipating today, tandem, we're up to about 30% with those two. Well, that's all well and good, but the real thing about perovskite is it's so cheap to manufacture. Um, silicon panels require that the silicon be melted through intense heat processes, which uses a lot of energy to essentially melt out and burn out all of the impurities. You're essentially taking sand and making glass out of it. So it's fairly intensive. Plus the cost of the perovskite material is actually cheaper than the cost of silicon. And you use 20 times less material in a perovskite panel than you do in a silicon panel. So not only is the material cheaper, but it's 1 20th of the material do you need? Because essentially it's just a liquid coating on top of something. So it doesn't use very much at all. Um, because the processes are so cheap, the material is so cheap, they're estimating they should be able to produce these perovskite at about 10 cents per watt um, production costs, um, which today uh, silicon panels are selling for about 50 cents a watt, you know, at best. So you're gonna get some pretty inexpensive panels going out there. Um, they're also transparent. So, so the silicon can be used for solar windows, um, for street signage, for windshields on cars, uh, integrated into paints on any surface, be absorbing this, this energy. So that's all the good stuff, right? But there have been problems. There have been problems with perovskite. One is they're used, uh, they're built incorporating lead into the system, which tends to leach out as these panels degrade. So you've got lead poisoning, lead pollution going out. Now the amount of lead that's in these panels is not substantial, but still in an industry that's claiming to be green and, and holier than thou, you know, we better get rid of that. We better clean up our act before we start mass producing, you know, lots of brain damaging toxic chemicals out into the environment. So that's been an issue. But the bigger issue is that they've proven to be relatively unstable. Um, perovskite has this nasty little habit of being susceptible to heat, moisture, and oxygen. Well, we're not gonna find any of those out there on, in the world, right? You put them up on a roof, what are you gonna be exposed to? Heat, moisture, and oxygen. So they tend to degrade and they degrade pretty quickly. In fact, uh, the first commercial type perovskite panels have been shown to degrade by as much as 20% in one year. So they lose 20% of their production in the first year, which not very commercially suitable. Um, now, 
That's been the issue that we've been to. This is why it's sort of held this promise, but we haven't seen perovskite out there in the marketplace. It, it's rapidly developing in efficiency and a lot of people are working on it. I mean, to go from 5% in the last, what, 13 years to 25%, pretty dramatic. This is what's happened in the last few weeks, as a matter of fact, all right? This is just in the last few weeks. Um, Korea, Korean um, scientists have announced that they've been able to produce um, panels by integrating in um, ferrocenes, ferrocenes, which is apparently a, an iron um, variation. I don't know what the right term would be, but by mixing this in with the process, it has seemed to eliminate the instability problem. Um, you know, and they've used this and, and they said they've tested it and it's been, it's one of these big breakthrough Eureka type things. Uh, it's been done by the City University of Hong Kong and uh, Imperial College in London. And um, these are now stable and in a multitude of colors, very vivid colors, which is interesting. And 20% uh, efficiency, no additional costs to this. So this is one of those that says, if this in, is in fact the case that they've dealt with the stability issue, then Eureka, we've, we've found it. Um, in May of 2021, the first production plant went on, on in Poland, which does not have this. They're trying to use the old version. But at the same time in Hong Kong and London, they're dealing with the stability issue. Uh, a group in India has announced they've been able to produce them without lead. So it appears that the two major things that, that have been holding this industry back just in the last week have been corrected, um, at least according to the science. So we may be within the next year for sure, finding that there are going to be lead-free, highly stable perovskites being mass produced to the general public and then, of course, the costs are going to go down and down and down and down. And down. So um, that's that's one of those things that I think we ought to keep our eye on because that's going to change pretty much everything um, once once you get into that. Um, because the the manufacturing, I saw a video on the manufacturing, and they basically are taking a little piece of glass and dipping it into this uh, compound of perovskite, it coats it and that's kind of the manufacture. Um, so, so if you can get ultra thin materials, then it's just a matter of stability of structure. You know, will it withstand the hail testing? Will it withstand, you know, will it be up to the ravages of the environment? How are we going to deal with that? And, uh, you know, as we can see, all the balance of systems are going to change. So to me, this is kind of like a change from maybe floppy disk to DVD. You know, I mean, we're going we're going into a new kind of world of solar, and that's going to change some of the things that we're going to have to deal with. So anyway, so that's my report on perovskite. Anybody have any comments on it or things to add or change or refute or rebut? Yeah, Mike. So if we are thinking of installing solar, should we wait to wait for this new technology to grow a little more? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to waste money, so. No, no, well, your solar array right now, I mean, the, the time to install solar is when you need it. Um, right now, the economics are good for solar and silicon, but my guess is they're gonna get better um, I'll give you an, a personal example, right? In 2014, I installed 4KW on our property at Blue Rock Station. It cost me about $13,000 to put 4KW of solar on there. So we're talking $3, $3 plus a watt. And of course, I installed it myself, so there was no labor or anything. Five years later, I installed another 4KW and it cost me 4,500 bucks to install the same amount of power. Had I waited 
Well, should I have waited? Well, it turns out the energy it generated in those five years was better than if I had waited. Um, you know, I, I made more than $8,000 in savings over those five years. So, but it was close, you know, I could have waited. Um, but so who knows, it's like laptops, you know, I always use that as an example. Should I never buy a laptop because they're always going to get cheaper and better? Or do I buy one and use it because I need it? And then, you know, when a new one comes out, but that raises an issue because this is going to be a big issue. A lot of people want the latest and greatest, right? So you've installed a solar array today and it works fine. But in 10 years, it's still working fine, but it's not the coolest thing on the block. So somebody's going to tell you, come rip this thing out and put the new purple perovskite panels on my roof because I think they look cool. Um, so what are you going to do with the old ones? You know, and there's going to be an aftermarket where, uh, you know, already there's a lot of motivation to salvage these things ship them off, reuse them, secondary markets, how does that affect warranty? And it might not even be a decision like it's the latest and the coolest. What about, it seems like they build a Walmart and tear it down every five years and move across the street. Well, they might have a solar array on top of the roof, but it's better and cheaper for them to simply dismantle and get rid of it than it is to try and move it to another location. So so there's an aftermarket there of products to salvage, repurpose, ship off. Um, a lot of cheap people like me who would be happy to have 10 year old products stuck on my roof if I can get it for, for deep, deep discounts. Um, or we can have charities that are gonna take this to third world nations and install them. You know, They're still fine. They've still got 20 years life or, or whatever. So I think those are, those are businesses that are realistically going to be there. Another issue is let's say you have damage at your property and a portion of the array is damaged, but not the whole array. And the insurance guy comes in and says, yeah, it's a write-off, you know? Well, there needs to be a business that can come in and dismantle that, salvage the part that can be salvaged and resell it. Because we know that there's an art to dismantling a solar array. Um, you know, we run into this with firefighters a lot, where if a house catches on fire and it's a big tangled wreck of, of, of burned out amber and ashes and there was a solar array on the roof, they're coming through looking at this big pile of char, not realizing it's still generating electricity in the morning when, when they go out and they can get electrocuted touching some piece of metal because they don't understand that these panels don't stop generating power just because they're, they're in a right. mangled mess. So, mm -hmm. so you need to have qualified folks out there dealing with the deconstruction mechanism as well as the construction. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, so don't wait, go out. It's a big industry. We uh, need to- And just do it. <laughs> yes, yes, just do it. <laughs> uh-huh. The, the Nike solar panels, right? Just oh. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have anything? Oh. Okay, well, that's all I've got for this week then. So uh, we'll call it a day. We'll see you next week. Same same time, same, same channel, all right? Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay.